Welcome to our, I think this is the fourth official training for the Cotton County School District. It's your volunteer training. We're going to cover topics that include the policies. You have a copy of the relevant policies in the handout. Um, you should have already filled out the application. So this is the pretty much the conclusion of this process. If you've been approved to come, then you've passed the background check and we know you don't abuse children. And so you're safe to come and be with our lovely babies. We're going to start with your role as a volunteer and how to be a successful volunteer. We appreciate you coming and being willing to go through this process. We appreciate you realizing how important it is to have those positive adult role models in the school. There's never enough space and time for a teacher or even a teacher and an aide in a classroom. You just, there are so many children with so many needs and wants and they love attention, positive attention from adults. And we have research that shows that having that positive interaction is what makes education more effective. So just your very presence, even if all you ever say is, good job, you can do it, actually helps children learn better. So we need you and we're glad that you're here. These are the topics that we're going to discuss, the school board policies. We're going to talk a little bit about what you can do in classrooms and what you should see when you're in a classroom. So one of the very first things we put up there is read to students. We have a district-wide focus on literacy. Um, in the parent involvement program, we're providing books to students to take home um, because sometimes students don't They'll actually say, well, I don't want to check a book out of the library because I only get to keep it for two weeks. For some students, they actually see that as a barrier. So what we're trying to do is remove barriers. So reading to a student, encouraging a student to read, helping them with their critical reading skills are the primary, the number one, two, and three things that we would always ask volunteers to help us do. Because when you model that and encourage that, those are the things that make an impact with our students. We also include tutoring students, mentoring students, as many positive interactions as we can give a student, that is what we want to provide. The district uses a PBIS, which is Positive Behaviors Intervention and Support System, um, that basically says that we need to give a child seven positive interactions for every negative one. So before you ever say, ooh, um, you know, we need to work on this again, or some of the strategies that you're using in class are not working well, you're not using your positive habits of mind, and so your behavior is becoming a little bit of a problem. Before we say that, we want to say seven good things. And when you're one adult with 10 or 18 or 30 kids in a class, that's seven times 30 that you've got to get through before you're doing any other corrective action. So making those positive interactions is another key thing that you can do. And you can see assisting teachers, chaperoning, and those other um, activities as well. The difference between volunteers and chaperones is included in the handout material. Um, you, may have already, you may already know what you're in this training for, whether you're going to be a regular volunteer, um, or if you're chaperoning. Um, the chaperoning is the highest level um, and more difficult, I would say, in volunteering because there may be times when you are alone with students. There should not be, but things happen. And so you may be the only adult in that corner of the bus. And what to say and how to say, because kids always test you, is, can be an issue and concern, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, eligibility. You already know that you had to do the application, the SLED and the sex offender background checks. We also work with DSS to make sure that there is not a history of abusing children. So let's talk a little bit about our school policies. Of course, the school board um, sets district policies and the school has to abide by them and enforce them. And so we ask for your support in that and also your awareness of policies. 
Now, what we've provided for you, and I'm actually going to open it up so that I'm going through as you're going through. Um, and we're going to briefly summarize the policy, but we've provided um, the document for you to read. So there's our policy on school volunteers, what you can do. And that's probably the longest one at three pages. That's IFCD. You have your policy on sexual harassment. <laughs> and then just a memo about the staff dress code. The staff dress code is different from the student dress code. Um, but it's meant to promote professionalism and show students basically this is what we want you to end up with. Want you to end up with when you get your professional careers in the wide variety of careers available to you, you will have to dress professionally. And so we try to support that. So kind of a summary um, starting with the attire. See how we ended? That was the last one I talked about. Now it's the first one because it's right in front of you. Uh, we're not exposing our midriffs or bare skin, um, especially if you're in the middle school. Um, we encourage you to wear fully enclosed shoes, especially, well, at any level. But if you do a recess, um, I cannot tell you. I did years, years and years ago. Not, don't have to know how many years. But when I did student teaching, um, I wore sandals because I figured, oh, we're going outside and da, 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 da. stepped in some ants. <laughs> Yeah, that was not fun. You think I get messed up over one little butt? Oh, I was, the children had a field day. They thought it was the most hilarious thing that had ever happened. I was not quite as, you know, happily excited. But if you're in a science classroom, um, if you're doing recess or phys ed, your cell phone, students are not supposed to have cell phones. They can be confiscated. There's more information on that in the student behavior manual. Um, but adults, like I said, we have lives, and life comes with a cell phone nowadays. So we ask that you keep it on vibrate or silent, and if you need to take a personal call, just let the teacher know and step out. You never know what might be on the other end of that phone, and if you have a reaction or something like that, um, even if it's completely harmless and it's great news, it'll throw a classroom off because children want to know. And it doesn't matter if they're the three-year-old babies, or the 17 and 18 year old babies. They want to know what's going on. They want to talk to you about your life. They want to be all in your personal business because isn't that so much more fun and entertaining than what I'm doing in the classroom? So that's really kind of the thinking behind that is that we want to stay on class and instructional time. <coughs> um, privacy concerns. Now, as a part of the AUP and the notices within the school, there are some things that we do that are recorded. Um, we tell parents and inform them that we are not going to personally identify your child in any form of media without your permission. So the newspaper might come to an event and take a picture. Without your permission, you should not see the, the class and the student grade and their full name and that's too much information. And so you should not see that. We ask you to extend the same courtesy to our students. So if you're doing something and you snap a picture with your child and, and some of their friends, that's, you know those children and you would exercise your good judgment with that. But if it's a different class, we're asking that you not personally identify children and that you're not sharing their pictures all over everywhere. Because as a parent, I can imagine, I wasn't at school that day, but I see on Facebook my child. Now, nine times out of ten, it's not a problem. But depending on the photo, what you might think is funny, other parents might not find as cute and funny. The other issue is security of personal and, and their educational information. So when you are in a classroom, if we are doing a test or you are proctoring, um, for example, the map test, the child score for our map test comes up on the screen as soon as they're done. You cannot share that information outside the school. There is no need to know for that. You might say there was a student who did this or that, 
and this is an issue that I want to address with a teacher, or I was so proud of this student, but we're not putting the student's name, we're not saying the student's specific grade, and attaching it with their name or other personally identifiable information. So if you're talking with another parent and you point out the child in the blue hoodie made this score, that's a no-no because we're required by federal law to protect their information. And even when it's good news, I mean, obviously everyone wants to share good news. Um, it's just there are legal restrictions on who should have access to a student's information. So wherever you are, you just want to be aware of that. Okay, bloodborne pathogens, yay! That just sounds exciting. The short version of this is if you see blood, don't touch it. Just, just you know. Um, and you'll be surprised because as parents, you want to make it better. You want to help the child and make it better. Um, and if there is a child who has a specific communicable disease, you would be made aware of that um, at the beginning of your visit, and it would be private confidential information. But the safe thing to do is, if you see blood, don't touch it. Um, we'll call the nurse, or the child will be sent to the nurse. The janitors have special training and special materials. There are certain chemicals that you're supposed to use if there's blood. Um, and there's a, a lovely little video. But the best thing that you can do is help keep the other children calm and away from the blood or whatever other item it is. If it's, you know, Throw up. exactly. Anything else, because especially with little kids, sometimes they still have accidents when they're stressed or something like that. We want to keep the other children away and let the teacher and the nurse or, who, or the administrator deal with the child who has the concern and keep everybody else calm and out of the way. Standard precautions, a term we get from our friends in the medical community, since BBPs are, after all, medical conditions, at least the virus. Standard precautions mean you assume that everyone is contaminated with HIV or hepatitis, and you don't take chances. A simple playground incident, a bloody nose or an athletic injury, each one has potential for exposure to BDPs. Protect yourself with personal protective equipment, or PPE, including gloves, as well as masks and protective eyewear if necessary. Your employer will provide you with PPE and train you on how to use it. But it's your job to make sure it's kept in good working condition so you can use it at a moment's notice. Damage or loose-fitting PPE does not protect you. When an incident happens and a person begins to bleed, your first reaction as a person of authority, is to help the injured person. But how do you know if the victim is infected with hepatitis or HIV? You don't. Because you Even always walk around with gloves in your pocket, right? From blood or body fluids, your natural inclination could cost you your life, or at least your health, and potentially the health of your loved ones. When assisting someone who is injured or bleeding, follow these precautions. If it's serious, send someone to call for emergency personnel. If the individual has a minor cut, they should try and stop the bleeding themselves. If they need help, apply pressure to the wound, but protect yourself first. Put on your PPE. Remember, cuts, sores, or breaks on your exposed skin should be bandaged, since gloves may leak if torn or punctured. If no gloves are available, place a barrier between you and the blood and body fluids, but it's always best to keep gloves handy and inspect them routinely so you're prepared for emergency. Remove the gloves as carefully as possible. Never touch the outside of the glove with bare skin. Peel one glove off from the top of the wrist to the fingertips and hold it in the gloved hand. With the exposed hand, peel the second glove from the inside, tucking the first glove inside the second. Then, dispose of your gloves according to your school's exposure control plan and wash your hands with soap and water. Okay. So, long way of saying, don't touch the blood. Thank you. So, next thing, don't sexually harass people. <laughs> um, sexual harassment is covered under civil rights law. It is unwelcome sexual advances, requests for favors. Um, even though you are not an employee of the district, 
If someone says, if you don't let me touch your booby, I won't let you be a volunteer. They have sexually harassed you. And we will handle that within the district. You have to make a report to Dr. Foster and we'll investigate it. I, I can't imagine how in the world that would happen, but anything could happen. So you have the right to be aware. Um, the most, I think the most common thing would probably be inappropriate language. Use, you can use the bully hotline, talk with a teacher and administrator at the school, or you can speak directly with Dr. Foster. There's his information. His extension is 40227. Um, and you could just remember 40227. If a child feels that they are being harassed or bullied, they are welcome to use the bully hotline, talk to a teacher or an administrator. Um, if someone talks with you about an issue of sexual harassment or inappropriate behavior, which includes language or touching, it needs to go to the administrator of the school. Um, prevention, once again, is key. Best way not to deal with bone borne pathogens is not to bleed. Best way not to deal with sexual harassment is not to have sexual harassment. And now we get to the fun part, working with students. So, you may be asked to assist in an area where you do not necessarily feel comfortable with the content. Again, remember the focus on literacy um, and reading. And second, what we're trying to get students to do is think critically and never be afraid to say, I don't know. I mean, I'll, sometimes I will start a lesson with that. We're going to talk about this. So, te y'all teach me. I don't know anything about this. Tell me what you think I need to know or show me how to do this, or what do you already know? Because we don't want to tell kids the answer, we want them to figure out how to get the answer, because that is the skill that's going to help them throughout their lives. If we could pump everything in our brains by the time we were 18 that we would ever need for the rest of our lives, a whole lot of things would not happen. Because a lot of things happen in this life because people simply do not know. And they did not have the skills to figure out how to find out and make the good decision. So skill building and understanding are the types of things that we want to build and teach and encourage. So I don't know is not a bad statement. It's just the beginning of finding out how to know and what to do. So that's what we're asking you to do. If you do know the answer or don't know the answer, we're trying to get the kid to figure out how to get the answer, not give answers. So don't give an opinion, don't guess. Say, let's look it up. What's a good strategy that you already know on how to do this? How did you do this when you did it in your homework? Where in the book might we be able to find this answer? Stuff like that. We have to do that with math with my kids. I haven't taken math since 1970. And they teach it differently now. Oh. You wouldn't think that math Metal could math. be different. Metal math. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of a discussion on what the um, positive behavioral intervention and supports is. Again, PBIS. Um, at each of the schools, they develop a matrix that goes along with this. So I think at Cottageville, it's Eagle Soar. And each letter in store stands for something, and they explain what it means. At um, Hendersonville, it's be sharp, and d I don't remember it. My son remembers it, but I don't remember it. Basically, it's act right, you know, and we give them specific examples. And in the matrix, those are some of the things that it shows. One of the examples of being responsible would be cleaning up behind yourself. Uh, one of the examples of... Um, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking so you should always share even if the teacher doesn't tell you to things like that um, there will be very few explicit rules that should be posted in a classroom I'm trying to look and see where they are um, Ten Commandments there's a little post right there so in this classroom these are the rules oh, okay. and they're all gonna kinda be basic don't talk when I'm talking Raise your hand to ask a question. Things like that. Um, positive behavior interventions and supports basically means that rather than just saying don't do that, 
we show examples of what the proper way to do that is, and then we remind them and encourage them. It's not as much punitive as things may have been in the past. So if there is a child who is just constantly talking, and they may be on topic, they may be off topic, rather than say, look, hush, we would probably say something like, I appreciate your enthusiasm, and I'm glad that you're so excited. However, your enthusiasm is preventing other students from being able to hear me. So one, let's stay on topic, and two, Let's look at ways that you can channel your energy and enthusiasm. Maybe you need to write down what you want to say and then pick the most important thing to share. So now they're building their writing skills. They're learning patience and respect for other people. And I haven't done a harsh correction because that distracts the classroom. What we're trying to get them to understand is respect for yourself and respect for other people is what should be stopping you from talking, not just being afraid of me because I'm going to tell you to hush and I'm going to tell you to stand in the corner and I'm going to take away your recess and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that because there's not always going to be someone there to police you. You need to be able to police yourself. And so that's what the goal is that we're trying to teach. And when it's implemented well in most districts across the country that have done it and implemented it well, behavior incidents decrease because the children police themselves and they police one another. And so instead of the one teacher looking for the badness, there's all of the students saying, you're not being sharp. We're supposed to raise our hands. And sometimes, as you know as parents, sometimes the peer pressure is more effective than the person who's in authority telling you something because <clears throat> I mean, kids will tell you quick, I don't have to listen to that old lady. But they'll do anything their friend tells them to. And who really knows what they're talking about? So if you're only going to listen to your friends, we're going to make sure that your friends are telling you the right thing. And we're going to teach it and reinforce it. Um, this is a specific example, PBIS, who gives specific examples. We recommend that you learn the children's names in the classroom, have them repeat it to you, have them spell it to you, have them sing a song, whatever they want to do. But we try to use their names and use it the way they say it, which sometimes may not be the way it's spelled. We'll call you by your name because that's a sign of respect and I want you to call me what I've asked you to call me, whether it's Miss Shelby or Miss Simmons or whatever because that's respect. So for example, um, let's say a child is having difficulty in reading something and they're struggling and they don't want to do it and they don't see why they have to do this stupid assignment anyway. I don't need to do that. I'll never need this again. Why am I having to do this? This isn't fair. It doesn't make any sense. I appreciate that you've been persistent and you've borne with it up to this point. And I understand that sometimes it gets a little frustrating, especially if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. But the next time you'll do it, it, it gets better. Every time you do it, you'll do better. So let's take a little break and come back to it in a minute. Or how about I read this next session and you just listen to it and tell me what you think. So we didn't say, look, that's the assignment. You need to go ahead and get to reading. You should know how to do this. You're 14 years old. You're five years old. You should know how to do this. Why are you complaining so much? You know you're at school. They stopped listening to you at the beginning. And so, and it's a constant thing. We do constant staff development on this. And it's hard. It is hard when you know I would never have gotten away with that in my classroom when I was in school. And you think you can do this? I mean, believe me, I know. But that's what we're working with is just reinforcing the behavior that we want them to do, encouraging them to do it, and not being as punitive. Because sometimes kids get stressed out too. They act out because they don't know how to do it and they don't want to admit it. And what this is doing is giving them an opportunity to have an out, a way that they can still do it and not feel bad and not look bad and not act out 
and make a little bit of progress because it's not you're not always going to get it the first time. Working with teachers. Again, there should be class rules posted. The teacher should have a schedule either on the board or that she, he or she can give you um, that's in addition to the school schedule. So the school will have a schedule for periods, but within the class, if you're in elementary, they have a daily schedule. We do math, we do story time, we do this, we do that, and they'll let you know exactly when. Some of the children, they're, um, they have different jobs, and it depends on which level you're in, but in an elementary, they'll have different jobs. They'll, there may be a student whose job is to keep them on schedule and tell the teacher what time it is. So it just depends, but get that information. If there are specific behavior issues, if there's something, hey, that's not right, and there's really nothing I can say that will help the student with that, you need to tell the teacher and or administrator, let them handle it. So we're not doing write-ups or anything like that um, because the teacher or principal needs to do that. And if you have any specific concerns about students where you think there might be an issue of abuse at home or they're falling asleep because they didn't get to sleep last night or something like that, then you would privately tell the teacher or administrator that information. Um, support us. We appreciate you supporting us during the day. Support us after school. If you need more information about curriculum or strategies to use in the classroom, um, we actually have um, regular staff development periods. If you're a regular volunteer and you're interested in sitting in on any of those, you can let the administrator or, or human resources know. Um, and just come and sit in and see the types of things we're taught to do. And then you'll know, well, this is the strategy they're using in the classroom. It's, it's great for homework. It freaks kids out. When you know the way the teacher wants them to do it, it's just it's two worlds colliding. It freaks them out. What class is this that y'all um, We do a series of staff developments. So... Some of it is associated with their faculty meetings, but also at the beginning and the end of the year and on teacher work days. We have staff developments and you can sit in on that. Um, even if you can't stay the whole day, whatever you do really helps us and we appreciate it. Just being in the hall, the fact that there's a parent in the hall, children walk straighter, it makes them feel a little bit prouder, and it makes a difference. Um, I know whenever I'm in the schools, I always try to say, what a great line. Who's your line leader? And you're doing an awesome job. That's one fantastic looking line. It can change the day for a kid because somebody saw and somebody appreciated, and I was doing the right thing when nobody was looking, and guess what? Somebody was looking. It, it can totally change their world view. Um, we always need assistance also in the media center, reading to and with kids. Um, these are other volunteer opportunities. And now working with other parents. Tell people good stuff, please. I mean, it's easy to get bad stuff in the newspaper or slightly depressing stuff on Facebook or on TV, but as many bad things as we hear happening, there are good things that happen in our schools all the time. There's good teachers and good kids doing great things. We have some incredible artists in our schools. Um, we have some students who, what they're gifted in, may not be something that's measured in a classroom. But as we have increasingly, like our um, the School of Natural Resources, DNR, um, we are finding so many great things that our kids know how to do in classroom, outside of classroom, and extra um, curricular activities. And just tell people about it. Because sometimes our perception gets colored by the negative things that we hear that we don't realize, hey, my kid is learning stuff today that I didn't learn in school. And they're doing really well at it. And if nobody tells you, how would you know? I mean, we constantly hear, oh, the schools are failing, the schools are failing. Well, they're not doing as well as we might all like, but there are many students who are doing exceptionally well, who are being recognized on state and national and international levels. And they get 
this much in the paper. And the kids that act out and cause a big problem might be one or two kids in the whole school, but they'll get the whole front page. And so how are we rewarding our students who are doing well? Um, the other thing is read what is sent home. Encourage other people to read what is sent home. We are required by state and federal laws to tell parents the stuff that is happening in the schools. But if nobody ever reads it, nobody knows. So read it and share it. Thank you for coming to this volunteer training, for wanting to be a volunteer. Please encourage other parents to volunteer and to attend. If, you can, if all you do all year is make field day, it will make your child feel like one of the most special people in your life and in the world, and that is who and what they are. And just encouraging other parents to come for field day or awards day makes a big difference. And that's it. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you're interested in being a parent volunteer, please call Human Resources at 782-4527 or call your child's school for more information. If you're more interested in Title I programs, please call our office at 782-4522 for more information. This program was presented by the Cotton County School District we encourage you to visit our websites and to visit your child's school on a regular basis. Thank you.